Recently, everyone has been talking about the enormous new expansion coming to Tokyo Disney Sea on June the 6th, Fantasy Springs. This is the biggest Disney Parks expansion ever, and it's going to include a Peter Pan Miniland, a Rapunzel Miniland, and a Frozen Miniland. But a lot of people have the question, how does this fit into Tokyo Disney Sea? A park well known for its rich storytelling, which has cohesive ways of making sense of all the lands. How can these three minilands exist next to each other in the story? Well, Imagineers did cover that, but it's kind of completely insane. But first, let me thank my Patreons. We don't have annual passes here in Tokyo, so every time I want to go to the parks so that I can get more footage for these videos, I need to pay a full day ticket. So they really help to make these videos happen. A huge thank you to all of them. If you want early access to ad-free videos, monthly Q&As with me, or to be able to message me anytime you want because you've got an upcoming trip and you want some insider info, check out the Patreon. The QR code's on the screen now, or you can find the link in the description. So I talked about it a little bit in my last video, but I just can't stop thinking about it. And I found some new information on the website as well. So I really want to dive into how these minilands come together, what the lore is of Fantasy Springs, and why it's completely crazy. <laughs> So the idea of this video actually came from a comment in my last video which talks about the huge new news update that we got celebrating 100 days until the opening of Fantasy Springs. This is one of my favorite things about having a YouTube channel is being able to interact with people who are just as nerdy about this stuff as I am. And we started to talk about the story of the Fantasy Springs Hotel. And interestingly, there's a passage on the website that I don't think was up in English before. Or if it was, then hands up, I missed it. Which is pretty ironic considering my last video was about all the things that everyone else has missed about the new update, but yeah. So let's dive right in. This is the story of Tokyo Disney Sea Fantasy Springs Hotel. Oh, sorry, but before we even get into that, the name Tokyo Disney Sea Fantasy Springs Hotel is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> anyway, um, it starts off with Once upon a time in a land far away, so far so good, there was a magical spring where a spirit lived. While the spirit fed beautiful gardens, she was curious and flowed great distances where she encountered enchanted stories. Upon returning home, the spirit used her powers to sculpt stone, branch, and bank into intricate shapes resembling those she met. As she bubbled and sparkled in pools, fountains, and waterfalls, the spirit often sang melodies discovered on her many journeys. So right there, that tells us a lot already. There's this magical spirit and Presumably, they've traveled around and witnessed the events of classic Disney movies and then come back to this place and recreated those places out of stone branch and bank. I guess <laughs> like riverbank. It's a little strangely worded. But yeah, it's used the magic of nature to recreate these stories, which poses the question... What are we looking at then? Where are we going? So I'm not actually going to Arendelle or Corona or Neverland. They're not actually those places. They are places that have been recreated by a magical spirit. And this gets really meta and ridiculous because we're in, <laughs> we're in a theme park. Oh man, hold on, I need a second. We're going to a theme park made by people who have made lands based on movies and the story in the land is that a magical spirit has gone to places and seen stories and recreated them. My head hurts. <laughs> what is going on? Uh, I like, on the one hand, I kind of admire that Imagineering wanted to try and make sense of all the mini lands and bring it together with a cohesive story. On the other hand, it's completely impossible, so they shouldn't have even tried, right? Like, it's completely crazy. And, like, I think when you're in Neverland and Frozen Kingdom and Rapunzel's Forest, none of this is going to matter. You're not going to even think about any of this, right? You're going to be in those lands. And they were definitely 100% designed to be like you're being immersed in those lands. The only places this story is relevant are going to be the entrance, I think, and the hotel and the kind of gardens around the hotel. They seem to be the only places where we're going to be seeing this rock work that's shaped like different characters and, and all of that stuff. So I think that's where it's really going to be relevant. Um, the passage at the end of that paragraph is quite interesting. 
Uh, as she bubbled and sparkled in the pools, fountains, and waterfalls, the spirit often sang melodies discovered on her many journeys. So I think that's going to make sense of, like, how the music is there as well. Which you don't really have to explain. Like, music can just be there. I know nobody told the designers of Galaxy's Edge that, but <laughs> in every other theme park land ever, you're allowed to just have music and not make sense of it in the story, right? Movies do that. That's called non-diegetic music. It's music that the characters can't hear, but we, the audience, can. Just to help to guide our emotional journey through the experience. So they really didn't have to explain that part, but this does give them an opportunity, which I guess we're going to hear. I'm imagining that you're going to be able to hear these spirits kind of singing little melodies and things. If you think that the rock work is going to include many different Disney characters, not just from Peter Pan, Frozen, and Tangled, it would be a really cool kind of thing if not only are we exploring it visually and trying to find all the little nods to different Disney films visually, but imagine if you're also walking around this place trying to hear the different melodies from different beloved Disney soundtracks. That could be really, really cool. Okay, let's carry on in the description because the next part is a lot more about the hotel and why that exists. One day, a duchess who loved travel and adventure discovered the beauty of the springs. Wandering along the rivers and streams of the springs, the Duchess found herself transported to magical places. The Duchess loved the enchanted springs so much that she built a little summer home nearby. As more of her friends visited, the Duchess built a grand palace to host them all. Even today, should you follow the water flowing from the spring's source, you would come to fabled kingdoms found in storybook tales. Okay, so there it is, storybook tales. So. These are things that happened in storybooks. So did the spirit go inside a book and then come back? We see this motif of storybooks popping up a little bit in the merchandise and also in the main shop for the land that's inside the hotel building, but only accessible from the land. So it is a theme park shop. So that just adds another <laughs> layer of ridiculousness to the whole thing. Did the spirits go inside the storybooks? Are the stories in the storybooks real and the spirits witnessed those stories and then someone else wrote about them? And who is this Duchess? I mean, this is actually where the story starts to make a bit of sense and gets a bit more grounded. You know, if you forget about all of the spirit things, you just imagine that this character, this Duchess, traveled to this place and discovered this fantastical realm and then she wanted to build a home there. That works, that makes sense. And going back to that comment section from my last video, which inspired this one, they suggested that the Duchess could be a member of the SEA. I love the SEA, and I think it works absolutely fantastic in Disney Sea and in Mystic Manor and in a few other places as well. But I worry that it becomes a bit of a crutch that Imagineering lean on a bit too much. However, this is Disney Sea. This is where the SEA is from. This is SEA land. <laughs> it's Disney SEA. So um, bringing the Duchess, who it says right here, loved travel and adventure into the Society of Explorers and Adventurers seems like a home run. And it seems like a really nice way of bringing this land into the park and making it feel like part of Disney Sea. Because right now, it feels like Disney Sea DLC. You know, there's only one gate in and out. It's a very strange shape, like it doesn't attach onto the park at all. It's going to be the only port that the transit steamer line doesn't go through. That's because it's the only port that that main river doesn't go through. It's always gonna feel very, very separate to Disney Sea. So I think anything that they can do to make it feel part of the park is gonna be really welcome. A big thing I'm really curious about on that note is, are we gonna be able to see Mount Prometheus from here? You can see it in some of the drone footage, but those are drones. We're not going to be flying around the land. We're going to be walking. And there doesn't seem to be any areas that are particularly raised up, except for the hotel rooms in the Grand Chateau. That's another thing that ties all of these different parts of Disney Sea together, is that they all have a view of Mount Prometheus. And Mount Prometheus is actually woven through the stories of each of the lands as well. Oh, I love Disney Sea so much, and it's getting better. If you also love this one-of-a-kind park, maybe you've been here before, maybe you've never been but you've always dreamed of it, make sure you subscribe to this channel. I'll be taking you through the Fantasy Springs Hotel and the land in its opening week. 
is so exciting. And if you want more information on Fantasy Springs and what we can expect, I did a full rundown that includes the new adverts, the new promotional material, and some new footage inside the land. You can find all of that in this video, so make sure you check that out if you haven't seen it already.